Welcome to From a Woman to a Leader, a podcast dedicated to discussing the challenges and providing tips for women in tech leadership. Hi, I'm your host, Limor Bergman-Gross, and in each episode, we'll hear from other successful women in tech, sharing their stories, insights, and advice. Join us as we empower each other to reach our full potential in the tech industry. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of From a Woman to a Leader. And I'm delighted to host today, Lizette Zunam. Lizette is a leader in quality assurance, and she's a public speaker, and she's a podcaster. So, so many things. Hi, Lizette. How are you today? Hello. Thank you for having me in your podcast, Limo. Excited to be here. I'm glad we were able to find a time. To do this so yes yes me. definitely definitely time 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 zone was a little bit of a challenge but we got over it so thank you so much for making uh, the time for me and we'll talk today about women in quality assurance and how to build how to know if that's the right track for you how to build your career and we'll see how things will flow we'll go yeah, from there totally Yes. Yeah. So Lizette, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, about your professional background or anything you want to share? Yeah. So my background is uh, I'm an engineer by trade. So I had a bachelor in computer science engineering and a master in computer engineering. And uh, my first job out of college, actually, I did an internship at Apple Computer, you know, in software testing, actually. And I enjoyed it. And then after that, I became a, a software engineer. So I work for one of the largest uh, telecommunication company in the world, Nortel. They no longer existed, but they were like the biggest one back then. And I, that's where I started as a software engineer. And I really enjoy it. But one of the things that I realized was I was spending a lot more time when I was coding in making sure that my code was really testable you know i was spending a lot of time documenting my code so that whoever was testing it you know it make it easier for them and i was working a lot with testing team as well you know in defining the test cases so i thought that i loved that but i didn't really too much look too much into it and then after i lost that job because the company went bankrupt my next job was at, was at yahoo where i was a white box text engineer which was a perfect position because it was a mix of like an engineering uh, skill, developer skill, and getting into quality. So that's where I really spent the buckle of my career, really like understanding software component, working with development team, and then even becoming a lead later on before I left the Yahoo leading uh, organization that were like geographically diverse in in four different places in the world, you know, Dallas, California, India and also in Australia. So from that moment, I got some really good experience. Then I started working for a couple of startups, you know. Then from there, I, I got into leadership, you know. And from there, literally, I started creating Q organization from the ground up. You know, I'll go to company, create Q organization, uh, and I also got into agile. So I'm an agile leader. I've been in been to practicing agile for about 12 years now, at the same time that I've been leading a uh, Q organization. So that's where really, and then from one role to another, you're learning, right? You, It's different challenge that you have to face, different things that you have to learn, different way that you need to show up as a leader. And that's where I am today. Today, I'm the director of uh, Q engineering at a robotic startup called Fourth Robotics. So we enable really all the machine of today and machine of the future for safety and security to allow them to be you know used in a safe way so that's my role so in this precise role I have to bring in my hardware experience and also my firmware and software experience so which is something that is very unique that I've never done before so that is exciting as well exciting challenge so that's it in a nutshell you know Whenever people ask me about my career, I try to give them like where you start and then the middle is just, you know, a lot of learning, but that's where I am today. So happy to, you know, dive in yeah. and so any other question. Yeah. So what was kind of the turning point for you? I mean, you mentioned you started as a software engineer. What was the turning point for you that you decided I'm going to focus on quality? 
Yeah, that's a good question because, and this is the controversial answer, right? For me, and especially now that we have a lot of AI going, from the get to go, I felt like, you know, if you have a good requirement, you can code easily, you know, coding is not, it never been a, a challenging for me, but I felt like the challenge was, you know, delivering quality, you know, everybody can just focus and do a coding, but delivering quality require you to have a holistic view of the product, the application, and it really allow you to collaborate with everybody in the, in the value stream. So you got to, you got to collaborate with the the product owner or the business analyst, depending on what framework they're using. You got to collaborate with the developer. You got to collaborate with now DevOps, you know, because Kiwi is part of the DevOps. So I just love that part that you get to collaborate with everybody in the value stream to deliver quality. You know, that's why I I changed and that's why I stuck into it until today, because I felt like you require a lot of skill set just instead of just being a software engineer. Yeah, absolutely. So if there's a woman out there starting her career, because we're talking about women here, right? Right. I mean, how would she know if QA is the right path or in general quality assurance, anything about quality is the right career path for her? That's a good question because I coach a lot of uh, women and even men too, right? And uh, what I always ask them is, first, you have to be willing to learn all the time. Because if you look on my resume, I've never worked for the same kind of company twice. So I've worked literally in various industry, all the company that I've been in. And so the main thing is to stay curious. So you got to be willing to learn, always stay curious, but always have the ability to question things. I think curious and questioning thing, because you're going to get a requirement, right? And you have to have the ability to like ask all the questions, because the question that you need to ask are actually things that were not written. So you have to be able to connect the uh, the dot between everything that is being telling you and also advocate for, for the end user because your goal as a quality person is really to make sure that the product come out and then you work for the, for the end user or whoever is using this product. So those are the things that I'm, I usually list, which has nothing to do with uh, any technical skill when you think about it have nothing to do with any tools because tech folks are always like, what tool should I use? But I feel like that is like how you have to start at a very high level. You know, those are the skill set that you need to hone in. And once you have that and you really have the interest into the quality field, all the other things just come, come naturally. So what tips would you give to someone? Okay. Let's say they, they know that they want to become a QA and, and build a, career in QA, what kind of tips would you give to them? How would they start? Yeah, my first tip would be, you know, get to learning, you know, find those, uh, if we, I would say like, go to like a course. And sadly, sadly, when we were going to school so many years ago, there was no QA courses. There's no course, you know, in your curriculum about testing. I had a couple of testing book because I just felt like, you know, okay, if I'm coding, I want to test. And I had a professor, rest in peace, he passed away a couple of years ago. He was telling us about testing. That was like one course where one chapter in the in the class was about testing. That was it. But I felt like that was an area that was not talked about. So I will say, yeah, go about learning what is testing about. You know, I just closed a boot camp that we did for African girls, you know, in collaboration with uh, African Agility and my company's ESI Academy. And we 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 had like an eight weeks, eight section, four weeks boot camp, you know, and really, and it was really boot camp style because the topic that we cover are really super important, but you have to like sit down and really dive into all this information. So try to find something like that. It doesn't have to be like a really dense course. It could be a little bit spread, 12 weeks, you know, but you have to take some some time to get to learning about the industry, right? And then the next step is get an internship or get a contract position where you join in as a junior Kiwi and then you start learning because the, the proof is in the pudding. Absolutely. And uh, do you know of any, I mean, I mean, other than the boot camp that you said you did for African women, do you know of any other boot camps you heard about in that industry that are good? I, I I don't know. I don't know. I know that uh, there's a lot of costs online 
and everybody you have to realize what is your learning style right I'm good at like I can just go on a YouTube you know have it on the side here I'm listening to it I'm even multitasking doing other things and then I just check in and you know look at it but I think you have to try to figure out what is your learning style are you like reading book do you like doing boot camp do you like listen to a podcast you know a technical podcast so you have to find out what is your learning style and then based on that go go hunt for the knowledge that's also part of the <laughs> the thing because in tech nobody's really going to give you a bulletproof way of like learning this you know there's so much information out there out there so you have to like hunt for the right information but you Absolutely. have to know what you want to do first you know do you even want to do this Absolutely. And, and definitely, I mean, you mentioned something that uh, I, I know is very critical and I was always looking for that. Someone that is in, an independent learner, basically that's what you're saying. Like you need to know what's your learning style and find there's so much information, abundance of information out there. Find whatever is the right way for you to consume information right. and learn. And you need yeah. to be able to learn independently and seek out knowledge, whether it's books, podcasts, courses, or what have you, and grow. Yes. Yes. And I want to ask you about your career. I mean, you have a very, very impressive career. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about some challenges that you faced mm -hmm. and how you were able to overcome and grow into leadership roles. Very impressive roles, heading quality, a director of quality. Yeah, that, that's it. That's a good question that, you know, it's like, how long do we have <laughs> to, to get into that? Ch I think the way that I see the challenge is, because I mean, if you poke my head, I, I can't really tell you one or two challenge, right? But the way that I see challenges, I see it as part of the problem solving. So, and I don't like to take one challenge that I learned from one organization to another organization. That's another thing that I don't usually do. It's probably my, my, the way that my brain is wired. But the challenge for me is the people usually. It's really the people. At the core of it, it's always been the people. So it's never the technical skill. You know, like I mentioned earlier, I've been going from one organization or one industry to another so when I come in I come in with a blank slate to understand what is the business here you know what is the product that we're solving what is our customer expect from us and how do we build quality into it you know and deliver quality for our customer so that is always the framework that I go in with now one what you will always hear people in quality say is when we go in we get higher it's like we want you here to solve quality, right? And what you unravel is so many other things, you know? It's almost like literally, and I always joke that QA people are QA agent, right? When you come in, you are an agent of change. So you come in, the problem is quality. People know that that is a problem. Then you start looking for the symptoms. So you have to navigate different departments, collaborate with different people, understanding what is the pain point. And then from there, try to find a solution create a strategy at a very high level for the organization that will define and solve those problems. And you know, when you're doing strategy and you want to bring change, part of change management is really people are the core of change management, right? So challenge is always some people are not easy, willing to change. That's yes. really, that's really, if we want to say where is the thread in everything, that's really where the thread is. It's yes. always boiled down to people are not willing to change. And when I was younger, it was not easy for me to understand that. But now in my, on the other side of this 40, I feel like I get it a little bit more. People are just not easily changeable. So I no longer attach myself to how fast people should change, you know. I know that because I think also experience and confidence give me the ability to realize that I know the solution. I know how the solution should look. I know the, the way we should get there, but I need everybody to realize that as well, you know, and how fast it's going to get, we all going to get there. It's going to depend on every people's ability to understand, you know, and get by into the mission and uh, the strategy. So those are like the main challenge that I always face is the people, you yes. know. Yes. The lack of understanding of the people, understanding the process, the lack of understanding of people, understanding even why do we need a QA team, you know, or what what does QA do, you know, the lack of understanding of like QA is always the bottleneck, they're wasting our time. So those are like, it's it's different version of those. And it's always driven by how people feel about, you know, 
the role in the organization. Yeah, and you mentioned that something very interesting and I wanted to ask you about it. So QA, you know, as a software engineer and I led engineering organizations, QA was always considered, oh, you know, they are, they are not as important, you know, as you said, they are, you know, keep holding us back. Maybe we don't need them. How do you advocate for the need for QA? And why is it even needed, right? We have DevOps, everything is automated, we have AI. Why do we need QA teams? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, this is the question that I'll ask before I join an organization. Because what I don't want is to join an organization and spend like three years of my life trying to explain to people why we're here. You know, for me, it's all about delivering value. So if we're here, we are delivering value. And sadly, QA is just one of those roles where I always say, like to joke, Nobody know that they need you until something is burning, right? Like everything is fine. But then as soon as something is burning, everybody's like, where are the QA people? You know, what happened? Why, why, is, why is this not working? So we always from day one has to show value. Why are we doing this? You know, and it, it starts from the top. It starts from the leadership. Leadership need to understand why do we have QA people in the building, you know? And then my job, then you start making my job easier, right? Because now I'm not going to spend the next three years of my life explaining everything. I want my team, the organization that I lead to focus in on delivering value. And that's what that we're supposed to do, deliver value. And that, that means different things for different organization and different things for different teams, you know? And we are usually sit in the middle of everybody, right? So we have to act as a glue. And change agent is my favorite role. When we are change agent, we question requirement, we innovate on the requirement, and we become SME, subject matter expert of the product that we are delivering. Yeah. And I've been in organization where we have achieved that so much that, you know, when somebody new come in or a customer come in or we get like a client side visit, they want to see our product. They're like, oh, go talk to the QA folks because they know in and out of the application, right? So... For me, it starts from the leadership. The leadership of the organization need to understand why we need QA. Don't just bring QA in to check a box because then that will that impact my mental health. I've been in an organization where, you know, all I'm just spending time is like explaining myself, explaining myself, you know, explaining why we're here, you know? And yeah. it go back to what I was saying earlier. Some of the challenges, the people don't really understand even what QA do, you know? And for yeah. me... I learned it just a couple of years, just recently, I think 2020, I was, because I participated a lot of in, you say I'm a public speaker, so I participate a lot of in conference and panel. So just on a conference, and this was after the conference, somebody pinged me and said they wanted to have like a chat with me, you know. And when I joined the chat with this gentleman, he told me that, you know, the way that I explained Kiwi was the, so different than how he expect Kiwi to be that it was refreshing him I was like okay what, what have been your experience you know so he's like I actually as a project manager never know what the QA people do you know yeah so and if you had to summarize kind of you know in a sentence or two what QA means to you or what's kind of the impact of QA in high level right I mean yes on, on the world even <laughs> what would you say no, Kiwi is really here to make it sure that the product deliver on the requirement and deliver what the customer expects. That is what it is. Every other thing is just minutia. Every other thing is just technical jargon that nobody cares about. You know, at the end of the day, Kiwi is just making sure that we deliver what the customer expects. So if I go on a website and the website user experience is poor, I'm always wondering, like, do they have a QA department? Who is testing this website? Who allowed this website to go out, you know, to go live in production? And if you dig, if I have time and I dig through the LinkedIn and talk to people, you realize that they don't have a QA department. They're probably thinking like you say, they're like, oh, we don't need QA people. Because five times of 10 jobs that I have in my career when I join, it's always because they've been in crisis mode. It's because they've been functioning for the last five or 10 years with no QA department and their hand has been like burned to a point where, you know, they're like, okay, next time we get a budget or something, we're going to hire a QA leader like me. And then she's going to put a team in place. Right. Yes. Which I'm always like, what have you learned? 
that's that's, <laughs> usually, that's usually my interview like what have you learned you know let's make sure that we learn clearly because people I don't know if this is something that we did in the QA industry, but people feel like our job is so trivial, you know, like, oh, I could just go in and test. Can you? So Have how you? would you, how would you um, help people realize that it's more than just as simple as, oh, we just test. Yeah, what? Because soft- go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, because software and hardware is complex. It's extremely complex. These days, we say we have chat GPT, we have AI. It still remains complex. The AI has not made it extremely easy for you to just create a piece of product out of a vacuum, right? You have to sit down, figure out what is your requirement, what is the flow. Somebody has to go in, implement it, and it's just usually not one person. It's a bunch of people implementing it. Humans are riddled with error. We are not perfect. And because humans are not perfect, but we're trying to create a product that is as perfect as possible, you need to infuse QA people into the mix so that they can double check the work and make sure that things work as we say. That is simple as that, you know, for anybody that is not even a technical person. You realize that I try not to use a lot of technical jargon when I'm talking because I feel like, you know, that's where you lose people, right? Into yeah. the whole technical conversation. Absolutely. So for me, it's it's that simple. When I go to like a, my daughter elementary school for career day and I explain to them what I do, that's how I explain it. Somebody needs to check that that you use it because the first time the developer developer is never going to be perfect because human beings are not perfect. We make mistakes all the time. So it's it's baking into the process that there will be mistake. But then you cannot ask the same person that made the code to also check it. They can check it to a, a point, but it's valuable to have a third person, you know, in the mix as a QA person to do that check as well. And QA do a lot more than that, but in a very yeah. simple explanation, that's how I will define it. That's great. That's a great explanation. And tell me something. Let's say there is a woman listening to us and she's in QA and she wants to get to the levels you got to. She wants to start QA organizations from scratch. She wants to become eventually head of QA or director. What would be some advice you would give that woman? How can she grow the career? For, you know? Yeah, I think to, to grow your career, you really have to have a game plan of like where you want to go, right? And try to understand what are the skills that you need for the next level. Because, you know, a QA analyst, a senior QA analyst or a QA manager, there's, there's, there's level to it, right? So you need to know, first of all, when I'm in my team, I'm always telling them, you know, this is the path, you know, my job is for you to take my, my job in, in the next couple of years, right? I don't want to be in this role forever. So create a plan for yourself about where you want to go and then start talking to people like me to understand, you know, what are the skill sets? So do like a SWOT skills analysis, pretty much like your, your strength and uh, your weakness and understand for this role, what are the skills that I need and how do I, you know, start honoring those skills? Because as a leader, my goal is to, to make my team shine, to coach them, to guide them, right? And the value for me building Q organization is I've been a QA person, so I've been in their shoes, and I understand the challenge, and I can easily coach them. Because the thing that happened in, the, in corporate is most QA team don't have a QA manager or QA director as uh, their lead. They usually... I shoved under like a director of engineering or director of software, you know, other, other roles that cannot relate to the day to day, you know, like if you've never been a QA person, how can you manage QA folks? So that there's also value into that. So that's a route. And a lot of people don't follow this route because they fear that, you know, there's no job security, maybe. Because the field is not so valuable, as we mentioned earlier. Like, why should I even want to go do that? But so you really want to know that you want to do that, create your plan, and then try to find the skill set that you need. Yeah, and, and find someone like you to coach you. If, <laughs> yes. if you don't have anyone in your surrounding to help your you, friend. right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, this is so important because not always we have people that uh, can support us in our growth. Not always people have managers like you, Lizette, who help people reporting to them to get to the next level. 
That's true. That's true. How will I know? Because I've always done it to people, but I've always been uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit grateful to have, you know, a director of Q engineer when I was at Yahoo, that was extremely helpful. You know, we never talk about my career, but I could learn from him, you know, how he was dealing with and coaching the, the group. So I learned from him indirectly because I didn't even have a plan to become a director of Kiwi back then. I just knew that that was a great way of managing the team, a cross-functional QA team. So yeah, it's really valuable to see somebody in the action and learn from that person. Absolutely. And what helped you push yourself forward and get to leadership roles, especially being a woman and a woman of color? Hmm. What? I think that answer is that when I was 12 years old, I was told that at 12, I was already quote unquote bossy, you know, and I always go back to that because I think I have a 12 year old daughter. So for me, it's a critical time. Right. And I just learned that a couple of years ago from my cousin that I grew up with that because I I get this question all the time. People ask me, like, when did you know you were going to be a leader? And I was looking in my past and I could only remember that when I was 12 years old, my mom was putting me in charge with everything that happened in the house when she stepped out. So I grew up to know that I was always going to be a leader at whatever I was doing, you know. So even if I was a marketing person, I was going to try to, you know, become a marketing leader at some point. So for me, it it just became natural. And I was mentioned, my manager that I have at Yahoo, not only I was focusing on my project, but I really care about what other people were doing too in my team. And just try to help them, you know, because for me, I felt like just trying to help us deliver value for the organization as QA people. So naturally, when I finish my work or when we in team meeting and other people are like sharing their challenge, I just try to help them spend some time with them. So those were like how I started. And it has not been easy for sure, because I don't know a lot of uh, now I do. But when I was a couple of years ago, I didn't know a lot of black women like me being director of QA. Yeah. Who even like call them and say, help me, tell me. So, but I had a lot of good mentor too. That were other people, other women, you know, from other culture and races that have been uh, instrumental also in uh, in helping me navigate this, <laughs> this tech uh, leadership career. Definitely. Definitely. So De- definitely podcast, it's not easy. Your podcast is super welcome because I think we don't have, we did not have a lot of these uh kind of uh, outlet for a woman to even hear, you know, about people like me or people like you 10 years ago. Yes, yes, definitely. And how would a woman find a mentor? I mean, based on your experience, what was the best advice you can give for, for a woman who wants a mentor? You know, this conversation of mentorship and sponsorship, for me, is a tricky one, you know, because I've always felt like, you should not go and hunt for mentor. You know, it should be a natural conversation. So when I was at Apple Computer for my first internship, they gave us mentor. You know, my mentor was the, the VP of uh, HR, human resource, you know. But was that helpful? Not really. So she has no idea what an engineer deal with in every, every day. You know, she was talking to me. She was a great person, great woman, you know. But she was just talking to me from her bubble as HR and working with just, you know, leaders. So I think you need different mentor at different time in your career, right? You don't, if you're just a QA person, you don't need a CTO to be your mentor. It's a little bit too far. Maybe you need just a QA manager. And I always ask people to have mentors that are outside of their company, mm-hmm. right? So Definitely. I had various mentors. I had a mentor that was an IP intellectual property lawyer when I was at Nortel. So every company that I've been, if Mostly, I would say five out of 10 companies, I've always had some kind of mentor, but I've never been lucky to have a sponsor. At least I don't think so, right? Where it's somebody that is like outside of, that is in the company at a C level and is really rooting for me or even yeah. giving me the, the game plan, if you want to call it, or the blue the blueprint of like, I think if you do this, you're going to get to this role. Nope, I don't think, I've never had that. I've always had people that I connect with, you know, that just became my mentor. 
at any given time. And I, most of my mentor, my long lasting mentor relationship has been outside of work. That's why I feel like those more fruitful. Yeah. They can really, they're not into the bureaucracy of the organization. They're really outside and they can really listen to you from a very distant way and compare with what they know about you and really give you, you know, valuable feedback. Because you have to trust your mentor too. You have yes. to trust that your mentor is out here looking for your best interest, you know, and you have to create a safe space between you and mentor to tell them about your real life, you know, your real life, you know, your, not your life that you show up at work with, but everything, your whole entire life, as in like your family life, your work life, you know, your, your struggle, your challenge and your fear. So yeah. I think the best mentor are people that you can find outside of work. So I've been in an organization in the past, like MentorNet. I don't think they're still around where I had people from corporate that were my mentor. And those were good ones, you know, and there were technical folks, technical women working at IBM, working at Accenture that you can, you know, connect with. But um, it, it's always tricky. I think what we need to start pushing the boundary is to ask executive in organization to be a sponsor for people that don't look like them. I think that's where that's where I want the conversation to be because mentor, you know, we can find our own mentor, but the sponsor, they need to not, they need to gravitate to you from my understanding. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, what what are you hoping uh, to achieve in the future? That's good. So one of the things that um, I definitely want to have my own company. I have a, my company right now, consultancy that I started in 2019 in the middle, almost like before the pandemic. So I want to grow my, my own consultancy, you know, in Africa and in the Middle East and also in the United States. That's my big, uh, <laughs> that's my big goal. You know, you asked me the question. So yeah, I always have that goal in the back of my head and uh, just trying to create a good game plan to, to get there. Yeah, is, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Is what and, I'm trying uh, to strive for. Yeah. And how can uh, people reach out to you? Yeah, What's the think, best way? Yeah, LinkedIn is probably the best way, you know. I'm not on Twitter. I mean, I have a Twitter thing. LinkedIn is probably the best way for this kind of conversation. So my Thank LinkedIn you. is simply Lizette Zuno. So Yeah, and I'll post I'll post your uh, LinkedIn uh, profile URL on the podcast episode. Thank you so much, Lizette, for uh, being here today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you, Limo. This was good. This was like, I have to go back and go listen to it myself. But this was insightful question that you asked. Thank you for doing this for women. Because as I mentioned, I don't remember the past 10, 10 years ago, having a podcast that talked about career for women specifically. So I am happy to have anybody that is interested in getting QA or even engineering in general, you know coach them or just talk to them about what is it like to be on this side. So thank you for Absolutely. having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of From a Woman to a Leader. This is your host, Limor Bergman Gross, and I want to encourage you to reach out to me on LinkedIn, Limor Bergman, and let me know what do you think about the episodes. Feel free also to comment on Apple Podcasts. And tell me, what do you want me to talk about? Which guests do you want me to bring? I really appreciate that and have a wonderful day.